Arian Foster and Reggie Bush are out for this weekend's games, but fantasy owners will finally have Ryan Matthews and Rashad Jennings back on the field. Should we be able to trust these guys, or do we need to look in another direction? And which players have the toughest schedules coming down the stretch? I'll tell you some guys who I'm going to be looking to trade away before the deadline. I'll answer your questions from YouTube and Twitter, and I'll give you my busts and the sleepers for week 11 of the fantasy football season. It's all on today's episode of the Fantasy Football Swagger Podcast. Everybody, welcome to the Fantasy Football Swagger Podcast. I am your host, Nick, also known as Clickwood, and I'm here twice a week, every week, to answer your questions and give you the advice that you need to win your fantasy football leagues. And this week, I want to get started right away here with some big injury news that will be affecting lineups this week because Arian Foster and Reggie Bush have been officially ruled out for Sunday's games. Arian Foster with the groin injury, Reggie Bush with the ankle injury. Both of these seem to be kind of nagging injuries. We don't really know exactly how long these guys are going to be out, but we do know, obviously, Arian Foster has been an absolute monster this season. He's got six 100-yard rushing days. He's got 10 total touchdowns, and he has been one of the top five fantasy football running backs this season, despite having a lot of problems really in the in the preseason people were not sure on Arian Foster I remember there was a league that I was in where he went in the third round yeah I passed on him late in the first and he ended up falling all the way to about the middle of the third round I would have definitely taken him at the end of the third round but because I I had a late first round pick and an early second I ended up taking I think it was I think I went Peyton Manning to Marco Murray in that league, so it's it's worked out pretty well for me so far, although I did end up trading away Peyton Manning early in the season, and uh, I did get a good amount for him in return. I, I've been okay with the trade that I made there, but uh, point being, though, Arian Foster did not he didn't have a heck of a lot of hype coming into the season, but he has absolutely performed like the type of running back that we expected him to maybe two, three years ago when he was one of the top picks overall. And this year, he's performing exactly like that. So we definitely like to see that out of him, but this injury is a bit of a concern. And of course, like I said, it is going to keep him out of the game today. So we t- then turn to a guy named Alfred Blue, who played earlier this season. He ran for 78 yards on 13 carries when Arian Foster missed the game in week three. Now, he's not quite the receiver that Arian Foster is, but the Cleveland Browns defense, who, which is the team that they're going to be up against today, he they have been absolutely atrocious this year. Uh, Blue could definitely be an RB2. I think for your standard scoring leagues in PPR leagues, I think maybe he is more of like a flex guy because I think that you could probably find guys who are more likely to catch passes than him. But given the fact that Foster isn't going to play, I do think it's likely that he gets somewhere between 10 to 15 touches. And that could be good enough if he sneaks into the end zone to definitely make your team uh, and, and, you know, give you a solid day on the ground for your running back position. So think about Alfred Blue. Don't be too excited about him. Don't go overboard or anything, but he could be a solid play this afternoon. Now, Reggie Bush, he is going to be out this week as well, and it's been a hell of a disappointing season for Reggie Bush. Um, He's only got three games this year where he's even done anything of value, and Joyke Bell is now going to be the starter. Well, I shouldn't say that because Joyke Bell technically was still the starter, but he's going to be getting the majority of the carries. He, too, has only had a few games this year where he has been even decent. Only three games total for Joyke Bell where he's had double-digit scoring in your standard scoring leagues. That's pretty disappointing for a duo that was one of the better duos in in the game coming into the season. Both of these guys were being drafted in around the fourth, fifth round in most leagues, all the way up to the third round in PPR leagues, and I even heard Reggie Bush going at the end of the second in your 14-team PPR leagues. So, 
you know, these guys have been one of the more disappointing duos as far as the running back position goes, and it doesn't really seem like that's going to be changing now that Reggie Bush is injured. Obviously, he's not going to be accumulating any points for you, but the guy who's going to be on the field more because of Reggie Bush, in addition to Joyke Bell, is Theo Riddick. Now, Theo Riddick, I think, has some interesting PPR value because this is a guy who has caught quite a bit of passes. He's essentially non-existent in the running game. I mean, he's when Reggie Bush has been out there and Joyke Bell's been out there, even when Bell and Bush haven't been out there, he's still only getting like two to three carries at most in most games. He didn't play versus the Saints, but he has 15 catches for 154 yards and three touchdowns in his previous three games that he played in. So that's some PPR numbers right there, guys. I mean, you're, you're talking five catches for 50 yards and a touchdown, essentially, in each of his past three games. So you can definitely look at that as being a potential sleeper pick here as far as your PPR leagues in the flex spot. If you're looking for somebody and your guy maybe got injured or, you know, maybe you're just not so excited about playing a Vincent Jackson or something like that, somebody who's been fairly disappointing this year, you could potentially look at somebody like Theo Riddick as being one of those low-end flex options. I'm not super excited about him just because I think that it's going to be Joyke Bell who's getting the majority of the touches, but you know, you could do worse as far as your shots in the dark type of players. I think Theo Riddick will get some touches today. I'm expecting probably somewhere between five to seven total touches for him, which, you know, isn't spectacular, but it could be enough if they're all catches and you're in a PPR league to make him startable. So... With that being said, both Arian Foster and Reggie Bush could be back in Week 12. We don't know for certain what the status of their injuries are, but we should make sure that we keep an eye on them because they are obviously two players that you need to pay attention to as far as injuries go. They've had a long string of injuries, both of them throughout their careers, and you know it's just it's one of those things you got to pay attention to the waiver wires. You've got to pay attention to what happens in practice. Are these guys being limited? Are they only, you know, going through basic drills or are they fully practicing? Because if they fully practice, that's a pretty good indication that they're going to play. If they're not out there on Fridays and they're not practicing in full on Friday, it's pretty rare that they're out there on Sunday or at least that they're 100% if they are out there. So be sure to pay attention to that in the coming week, but definitely put both of those guys onto your bench and get somebody else in there on Sunday today. Now, I talked a little bit in my previous episode here about some players who are going to potentially be able to put up some good numbers here at the end of the season. Guys who maybe haven't been performing quite as well, but possibly could turn it around just given the fact that they have some nice schedules coming up. So be sure if that's something that you're interested in to go back to the previous Fantasy Football Swagger episode and just you know pay attention to that section because I think it's some good information. It's definitely something that I'm personally taking advantage of, going that extra step and doing that extra research to make sure that your team is set up to win down the stretch here in the playoffs as they're coming up. But I also think that we need to take a look at the opposite side of that argument, which is players that are not going to have good schedules going down the stretch. And I decided to come up with a few guys at each position, well, at least one guy at each position, then I'm going to give you guys a couple of extra guys here at the end. But I want to start off here at the tight end position, and we've got Greg Olson, because Greg Olson is somebody who I think a lot of people are really, they're really counting on down the stretch to be their starting tight end, and the unfortunate thing right now is that you just don't have a heck of a lot of depth at the tight end position, so... When you when you look out there on the waiver wire and you've seen you just see guys like Michael Rivera who I I'm actually pretty high on for the remainder of the season I think Michael Rivera is gonna, going to continue to get a good number of targets and that's really what you look for out of a tight end but uh, with a guy like Greg Olson he has an extremely difficult schedule coming up guys he is facing one of the top eight defenses as far as points allowed to opposing tight ends. In every one of his games except for one here down the stretch. He's got Atlanta in week 11 where they're the number eight defense in points allowed to tight ends. Then he goes to Minnesota who's third and then he has New Orleans who is the best defense in the league at opposing tight ends. You can imagine why they play against Jimmy Graham in practice every day and yeah that's a good way to to see if your team can stop tight ends every day. So uh, they do a great job against the tight end position. Week 15 he is at or against Tampa Bay excuse me and they're the only the 14th ranked defense against tight ends. That's the best that he plays down the stretch 14th 
That's not particularly great. It's about average. It's actually slightly better than average as far as uh, stopping tight ends. So not a great matchup there. And then he's back home against Cleveland in week 16 and then on the road in week 17 again against Atlanta, the number eight defense. Guys, like I said, five of the final six games for Greg Olson is are against top eight defenses against tight ends. And then he also does have the bye in week 12. So all of that just leads me to think that Greg Olson's going to have a tough time doing much down the stretch here. Cam Newton's just been inaccurate as all hell. And just nobody is performing other than maybe uh, Kelvin Benjamin with any sort of consistency in that offense. So it's hard to trust a guy like Greg Olson. What I'm telling people to do right now with Greg Olson is try and package him in a deal to get a better tight end. Now, I know, obviously, it's going to be difficult to go out there and get a Julius Thomas or a Jimmy Graham or a Rob Gronkowski. But when you can maybe package together a wide receiver or something like that and Greg Olson, you might be able to make that move to get that upgrade at tight end and get somebody who is going to be able to give you those big points down the stretch at a position where you can really make a big difference. And that's what tight end is to me. And that's why going into this season, I was all about taking Jimmy Graham in the first round. I was all about taking Julius Thomas in the second round or the early second round even. I mean, I was talking Julius Thomas like 14th overall. That's late first round in a 14-team league. And to me, you look at guys like Jimmy Graham and Julius Thomas and Rob Gronkowski, and they're performing as well or better than your top wide receivers. So I'm absolutely willing to trade a top wide receiver, you know, a guy like, let's say, um, right now, if you could trade Calvin Johnson and Greg Olson and get Jimmy Graham in return, I'm doing that. Because Calvin Johnson, don't get me wrong, I love Calvin Johnson. I think he's one of the top players going down the stretch here now that he's healthy. But he could get injured again, first of all. And secondly, when you look at the wide receiver position, there's just a hell of a lot more depth. I mean, even if you had to play a guy like Martavis Bryant or an Odell Beckham or, you know, somebody like that down the stretch in the spot of Calvin Johnson, it's so much easier to come across guys who you can start at that position than it is at tight end. Tight end after like the top five is just a barren wasteland of garbage. And I just, I look at Greg Olson as a guy who you can't not have in your lineup. And that's the unfortunate thing about it because like I said, there just isn't anybody else out there. So when you've got Greg Olson, you pretty much have to play him. And he has poor matchups in almost every single game here down the stretch. I don't like it. I just don't like it at all. And I look at Greg Olson as a guy that I'm probably going to try and move uh, here at the end of the season. So let's move on now to the wide receiver position. And guys, I have the Philadelphia Eagles wide receiver duo, Jeremy Macklin and Jordan Matthews. These guys have a very difficult schedule coming up. Now, I will tell you that this is probably the least brutal of all the schedules that we're going to look at here, but it's still one that we have to look at and be a little bit concerned about just because these guys, to me, I don't trust them as much as I do the other top receivers. I like Jeremy Macklin a lot, and I'm going to tell you if you have him that you pretty much need to play him. But at the same time, though, if you're you're asking me who's more likely to continue the success that they've had, Demarius Thomas or Jeremy Macklin, I mean, it's a no-brainer. Jeremy Macklin's just not the type of talent that Demarius Thomas is. So that's why I look at this as being a potentially really difficult to predict type of situation. So I look at a Jeremy Macklin and a Jordan Matthews, and I see their schedule coming up here. They have Green Bay here in Week 11, the 20th-ranked defense against opposing wide receivers, which is a solid matchup. It's not anything to worry about. And then they go to, or then they're at home, excuse me, against Tennessee, and they're the 13th-ranked defense against wide receivers. And then they have a brutal schedule here over the next three games 13 14 and 15 which are the three games leading up to your playoffs and week 15 in a lot of leagues is the playoffs guys they have the fourth ranked defense with Dallas in Dallas in week 13 and then they're home against Seattle the fifth fifth ranked defense against opposing wide receivers and then they're back at home against Dallas again in week 15 number four against wide receivers Now, don't get me wrong. Weeks 16 and 17 don't look too bad. Washington has the 14th ranked defense. So if you do make it to the playoffs and you get into the Super Bowl, 
It's not a bad situation to be in for them to be up against Washington. I don't think anybody's really worried that much about a Washington defense or anything. In week 17, though, the Giants defense actually is not too bad against opposing wide receivers. They do rank ninth in the league in fantasy points per game against the wide receiver position. So again, I'm not super concerned about this, but the thing is, though, is when you have a combination of a fairly difficult schedule and players who I'm just not super confident in their actual skill set, along with Mark Sanchez at quarterback, I think there could be a downtick here as far as production goes. So given the fact that Jordan Matthews had a really great game this past week, Jeremy Macklin had kind of a down game, you want to try and sell people on the fact that Jeremy Macklin just had one bad game out of the entire season. Don't be too worried about it. That's how you want to sell it. With Jordan Matthews, you want to talk about how basically he's turned into Mark Sanchez's top target in that offense. Now it's only been one week and I'm not, like I said, I'm the previous episode. I'm not expecting that to continue, but that's how you sell it to somebody when you're trying to trade a Jeremy Macklin or a Jordan Matthews away. You want to get as much production or as much in return, excuse me, for the production that you've gotten out of these guys. So do your best to try and move these guys and get an upgrade at another position or potentially even just trade them for somebody else who's a top player at the same position. Now, Moving on to the running back position, this one to me is really, really interesting because I look at it like this. I don't see how you can bench this guy, but at the same time, this is an absolutely horrible schedule coming down the road here, and that is for Marshawn Lynch, Seattle Seahawks running back, who had the biggest fantasy day of his career this past week with four rushing touchdowns. But guys, this is a heinous schedule that's coming up here. Let me run this thing down for you. Week 11 here at Kansas City, they are the fourth ranked defense against opposing running backs. In week 12, they play Arizona, who is second. In week 13, they go to San Francisco, who is currently the ninth ranked defense against opposing running backs, which isn't horrible or anything. You know, it's not a terrible matchup. And Marshawn Lynch actually does have a history of decent success against the San Francisco 49ers. Not any monster games or anything like that, but, you know, solid Marshawn Lynch-like production, you know, 80 yards and a touchdown here and, you know, 105 yards without a touchdown there. You know, solid Marshawn Lynch-like games. But the, the San Francisco 49ers are starting to get healthy. Patrick Willis is going to be back. They, they're getting Alton Smith back. This is going to be a tough team to go up against for any offense. And San Francisco is just notoriously a good defense. They've been a good defense for five years now at this point. So I look at it like a very tough game there at San Francisco. I don't see much of a chance that Marshawn Lynch puts up huge numbers in that one. Week 14 is where he could do some damage. He is on the road against Philadelphia, who is the 17th ranked defense against opposing run backs but again that's only about an average defense it's not like the 28th ranked defense or anything like that it's not some team that has just been horrible at stopping the run Philadelphia is okay at stopping the run they're an average defense then in week 15 he's back against the 49ers this time at home week 16 back at Arizona who again is the second ranked defense and then in week 17 he wraps it up at home against the St. Louis Rams the 10th ranked defense Guys, this schedule is brutal. Just to run down the numbers, 4th, 2nd, 9th, 17th, 9th, 2nd, 10th. That is absolutely brutal for a running back to have to go up against. And Marshawn Lynch has put up big numbers against bad defenses this year, but I'm not for certain that he's going to be able to continue that type of production. He's been an amazing player, and this is the prime time to trade Marshawn Lynch. Trade him, trade him, trade him. I'm telling you guys, this is going to be a tough schedule for him down the road. I'm not going to tell you that he's going to be horrible. I'm not going to tell you that he's not going to be start worthy. He is. If you've got him on your roster, you play him every week, regardless of matchup. But I'm telling you guys, you're not going to get the type of production that you've gotten for him for the first 10 weeks of the season as, as you are down the road here. You're just not going to. He's going to have a tough time in these final seven games. Again, six of those... Top or the, of his final seven games, excuse me, are up against top 10 run defenses. It's going to be tough. And Seattle's offense isn't spectacular. They're not as explosive right now without Percy Harvin. They can't really pass the ball very effectively. And everything's on Marshawn Lynch. If defenses know that, they start keying in on him. It's going to be a long, long day for Marshawn Lynch on many of these occasions. And I'm not for certain that he's going to finish as a top five running back like he currently is. So again, 
I'm looking to move him. I'm looking to get elite production. I'm looking to get a guy who I can trust going down the stretch here. If I can trade a Marshawn Lynch and get a guy that's, you know, a solid contributor at the running back position and maybe somebody else at another position or or if maybe I can trade him for, let's say I'm, I'm hurting at wide receiver or something like that. Or I'm hurting at tight end, for example. If I if I'm somebody who has Greg Olson, let's say for example, if I can tra- trade Marshawn Lynch and Greg Olson and get a solid, or, you know, a number one wide receiver like Demarius Thomas or something like that, and maybe another player at another position, I would absolutely love to make that trade right now. I want to get the guys who are going to put up as many points as possible down the stretch here, especially in the playoffs and weeks 15 and 16. San Francisco and Arizona for Marshawn Lynch, no thank you. I'm not excited about those matchups. So finally, moving on to the quarterback position, we have New York Jets quarterback Mike Vick. Now, I know Mike Vick isn't probably somebody who I'm going to be advocating that you start most weeks, but I know that there are people that are in tough situations right now at the quarterback position after the injuries to Nick Foles and, and Carson Palmer. And, you know, maybe you had somebody that got benched. Maybe you had a Ryan Fitzpatrick or, or you know, possibly a, an Austin Davis if you were in that bad of a situation. And, you know, you're looking at the waiver wire and you see Mike Vick still out there. I want to tell you guys, he is not somebody that I'm super excited about going out and picking up at the moment. It's going to be pretty difficult for him to continue the type of production that he has put up even in this short period of time he's just been a decent fantasy quarterback and I'm not sure that that's even going to continue here in week 11 Mike Vick obviously is on a bye but in week 12 he heads to Buffalo at the number five ranked defense against opposing quarterbacks week 13 at home versus Miami they're number two against quarterbacks week 14 at Minnesota they're the fourth ranked defense against quarterbacks In week 15 and 16, it does get a little bit easier. They're up against Tennessee in Tennessee in week 15. They're the 12th ranked defense. And then New England in week 16, the 14th ranked fantasy defense against opposing quarterbacks. And then they finally finish out the season back at Miami, the second ranked defense against fantasy quarterbacks. So guys, four of their final six games down the stretch here are against top five defenses against fantasy quarterbacks that is brutal absolutely brutal that is I mean even if you had like a Peyton Manning that's a brutal uh, situation but when you've got a Mike Vick you can't buy into this at all it's it's a bad bad schedule and like I said guys I know not a lot of people are relying on him at this point but I would definitely be looking elsewhere down the stretch here than Mike Vick so look to trade him away if you can if you can get anything in return for him I'm not sure that you'd be able to Uh, but like I said go out there and if you've got Mike Vick right now make sure that you're trying to acquire a different quarterback to take his place now other people who have some tough schedules coming down the road Basically, the entire Arizona Cardinals offense, I mean, everything, quarterback, running back, wide receivers, they have an absolutely heinous schedule coming down the stretch here. I'm not going to run through all of it. You can look it up if you want to, but guys, that is probably the toughest total schedule. I mean, obviously, you can imagine if you have to go up against Seattle and San Francisco, and even St. Louis has a decent defense down the stretch, and they do. They have quite a few division games left on their schedule, and just brutal games overall for the Cardinals, so I'm not excited about anything in that offense. If I've got Andre Ellington, and I've got a Larry Fitzgerald, if I've got a Michael Floyd or a John Brown, I'm probably trying to move those guys right now and get as much as I can in return for them, especially if they have a decent game this weekend against Detroit, but like I said, guys, Detroit I I think I mentioned this before. Detroit's defense is quietly elite this year. I mean, we're talking top three defense in the NFL this season. So, uh, you know, don't be surprised if today they do not do much in Arizona. I mean, Arizona is just, they're in a tough situation without Carson Palmer right now. So again, I would be looking to try and get all of these Cardinals players off of my roster. If I can make a move before the game start today and I've got an Andre Ellington or, or any of those guys, I'm trying to do it. I really, really am. I do not like this schedule going down the stretch. Other guys, Lamar Miller down the stretch, brutal schedule. Darren McFadden as well. Obviously, I don't think a whole hell of a lot of people are relying on Darren McFadden, but if he's, you know, your flex or something like that, make sure you're not putting him in there against some of these bad matchups that are coming up for him. And then Jay Cutler is a guy who has been a good fantasy quarterback for the most part. I know, obviously, he had just that horrible game against the Packers, but... 
if you can look past that somehow in your mind and just get beyond the fact that he had a one horrible game, uh, he has been a good fantasy quarterback this year. And if you can sell him still to somebody who's still a believer as far as what he's going to do uh, and what he has been doing, if you can tell them, look, look what he's done. His fantasy points per game are very, very good. If you can get somebody else or you know package him in a deal for an upgrade at another position, I'm definitely looking to do that right now. Jay Cutler has an awful schedule going down the stretch here. So look to try and move him off of your roster roster as well. Now, guys, we're going to move on to the portion of the show where I answer your questions from YouTube and Twitter. Now, be sure if you guys are interested in asking any questions, make sure you leave them in the comment section of this video. Or, of course, you can send them to me on Twitter at ClickwoodTV. If you send them to me in time, I will do my best to get you an answer before the games kick off today. But I can't guarantee it, obviously. I mean, I've gotten quite a few responses in already. So uh, I'm going to do my best, but I can't promise it just, you know, Try and get me the question as quickly as possible, and I'll do my best to answer it. So let's get into it. The first one comes from Leon Sandcastle, which I love that name. I love that name uh, on YouTube, and he asks, flex question. I have Odell Beckham Jr. versus San Francisco, Ryan Matthews versus Oakland, CJ Anderson at St. Louis. Who should I play in my flex? Well, Ryan Matthews obviously back from an injury this week. He is likely to get the majority of the carries today against the Oakland Raiders. He has a great history against the Oakland Raiders as well. C.J. Anderson, we're not for certain at this point still who is going to end up getting the the bulk of the carries. Sounds like Monty Ball is going to play today. So we look at this as kind of possibly being a dual-headed backfield. And while I like Denver's offense, I'm not sure that I like it enough to sustain two guys being fantasy relevant. What I want to do this week, if I have the option of, and I have good players to play instead of them, I want to sit both CJ Anderson and Monty Ball and just kind of get a better idea of what's going to happen down the, the next couple of weeks here based off of what we see today. So, you know, trying do that if you can. In this situation, I think you have two other options that I like better. So it comes down to Beckham Jr. against San Francisco or Ryan Matthews against Oakland. Now, normally I would go with Ryan Matthews because of, like I, like I said, the success that he's had against them throughout his career, but we don't know that he's going to get all of the carries. We don't necessarily even know that he's going to get, you know, 15 touches, but because of that, I am going to go ahead and take Odell Beckham Jr. He has been hot, one of the hottest receivers in the league since he got activated. And I just don't really see any reason to be that worried about the San Francisco matchup. Now, obviously, I do think that it, this is a tougher matchup than what he's faced lately. But still, the guy's getting targeted enough that if he gets targeted eight, nine times in a game and he only catches four or five passes even, he could get, you know, 80 yards and a touchdown. And that's certainly good enough to be your flex. So I like Odell Beckham this week, and I hope that turns out good for you. So... Next question comes from Edward Connolly on YouTube, and he asks, I've got another flex question. Deshaun Jackson versus Tampa Bay or Ryan Matthews versus Oakland? So this is one where I am going to play Ryan Matthews. I think that he, like I said, has a good matchup here against Oakland. I do think that he's probably going to get somewhere between 10 to 12, 15 maybe touches. Um, But like I said, it's a risk. So that's why I wasn't excited about playing him over Odell Beckham. Now, Deshaun Jackson against Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay is not a good defense. Don't get me wrong. They are pretty damn poor. But Deshaun Jackson is just too up and down for me personally. And with RG3 throwing the ball, that can really increase the inconsistency of a player. So I I just, I'm I'm not for sure that I'm going to be excited about Deshaun Jackson. Wouldn't be surprised at all if Deshaun Jackson catches a touchdown pass, you know, four minutes into the game today, and I'm already like, oh boy, I just told that guy to bench Deshaun Jackson, and he's already got, you know, 12 points on the board or whatever. But, you know, you have to look at it like this. Who has the more likelihood of being the bust for today? And to me, it's pretty clearly Deshaun Jackson. I wouldn't be surprised if he catches three passes for 40 yards or, you know, something like that for a stat line. Whereas Ryan Matthews, if he touches the ball, 10 times today I think there's a good likelihood that he gets into the end zone and I I just think he's a safer option for you which is I know baffling considering he's coming back from an injury but that's just how inconsistent Deshaun Jackson is even in a good matchup I just I, I can't trust him over another guy who's going to touch the ball on a regular basis next question comes from Danny Griswold on YouTube and he asks 
Should I play Aaron Rodgers versus Philadelphia or Tom Brady at Indianapolis? Now, I'm just going to answer the question first, and then I'm going to get into a little bit more on this. But, all right, Aaron Rodgers at Philadelphia is the answer to this question. Aaron Rodgers has been the probably, well, maybe other than Peyton Manning, the best fantasy quarterback in the past five weeks or so. And he has just been destroying defenses. It doesn't matter what what he's going up against. In Philadelphia, they're nothing good on defense. They're an okay defense at best. So I'm not worried about that. And I understand that I understand that Philadelphia has been playing pretty well lately, but I, it's just so has Green Bay. There's just I mean like it's it's good on good, but Aaron Rodgers and that offense, I'm taking them pretty much over anybody at this point, other than maybe a Peyton Manning. Now uh, Tom Brady. Being that he's at Indianapolis, I think that's a little bit tougher of a matchup. I wouldn't be surprised if Brady has a great game here. But my point that I'm going to try and get to here is you have to trade away one of these players right now. Right now. Do it as soon as you can. If you look on the on your other opponents in your league's roster and you see somebody that has, let's say, a Matt Ryan at quarterback or even a Matt Stafford or, you know, a Jay Cutler, or, you know, somebody like that, there's going to be somebody that doesn't have a great quarterback right now. Go out there and do everything you can to sell one of these quarterbacks to them. I would rather sell them Tom Brady down the stretch because I'm not for certain that he's going to continue the production he's been at. I think Aaron Rodgers is going to continue to be a top five quarterback down the stretch here. But look, these guys are both elite quarterbacks. They're both QB1s, and somebody needs to be giving you something for one of them. You can't just sit and let them be on your bench and accumulating massive points. You have to take them and get an upgrade at another position. Even if, like, for example, I think we talked about this a little bit before, but, you know, like, take a guy like a Mark Ingram and a Tom Brady and package them together and get an elite running back in return. Because I understand Mark Ingram has been putting up monster numbers, and hey, he might continue to put up really good numbers, but you can't tell me you'd rather have Mark Ingram than Jamal Charles. Or you can't tell me that you'd rather have Mark Ingram than, you know, uh, Calvin Johnson or, you know, something like that or Antonio Brown or Jordy Nelson, you know, guys like that. You have to go out there and make a trade. Please, for the love of God, like don't sit here with two elite quarterbacks on your roster all season, guys. You can't do this to yourself. You're handicapping yourself so, so badly. Please, for every everybody out there, if you have two elite quarterbacks or you have two elite tight ends, trade one of them away because you're probably hurting at another position. Please do it. And then I don't have to sit and answer questions like this. Not that I don't appreciate your question, I do. And if you've got, you know, if you're sitting there with just a stacked lineup at every single position, Good on you. Have two amazing quarterbacks. Fine. But I just can't imagine that somebody's out there in any sort of a decent size league, you know, a, a 10, a 12, a 14 team league, and they have two of these quarterbacks and their their roster isn't, you know, hurting somewhere else. You, you almost have to be. All right. Next question from Mr. Name Unknown is his name, I guess, on YouTube. And he says, I'm currently sitting on Cam Newton as my quarterback. I got an offer to trade him for possibly Mike Evans or Sammy Watkins. Should I trade Cam for either of them? Now, and just a bubble here, I would not make this trade. I think you've got to keep Cam Newton because he has such a great schedule going down the stretch. Um, but at the same time, though, I do like Mike Evans and Sammy Watkins this season. I'm just not for sure for sure that they're going to put up consistent points. Now, don't get me wrong. Cam's been super inconsistent, as we talked about. But I like the schedule going down the stretch anyway. Uh, but the reason that I that I brought up this question and, and then I picked it for the show was that this is actually a keeper league question. And, and this brings up a very good point. If you're in a league right now where it's a keeper league, and you're not looking like you're going to make the playoffs, now is the time to start trading away your studs. And I understand that that sounds crazy, but it depends on how your keeper league is structured. Because if you're in a league where you keep the player based off of their round that they were drafted in, now is the time that you have to trade away a guy like Cam Newton because you're not going to want to keep him for the round that you kept that you drafted him in this year. You're just not. And if you're in a league where, like for example, you can trade a, a Cam Newton for a Sammy Watkins or a Mike Evans, and these guys were likely drafted fairly late in your draft, 
yeah, I'm looking to do that trade for either of these guys because I think that the long-term possibilities of Sammy Watkins and Mike Evans being elite wide receivers or at least wide receiver two-level players are very, very good. And with Cam Newton, we don't see a hell of a lot of production out of him right now. He's not running the ball like we thought he would to start the season. Well, granted, before the season, I brought up the point that I actually didn't think that he would run the ball as much this year because uh, he he was injured coming into the year with that back injury. But we don't see the, the production as far as his fantasy point totals in the air. Now, Calvin Benjamin has put up decent numbers, and Greg Olson's put up decent numbers, but nobody else in the offense has done a damn thing. And when you've only got two guys catching the ball, it's tough to put up solid fantasy numbers from week to week. And there's really no reason to think that he's suddenly going to get better. This offensive line is atrocious. They can't run the football. And it's everything on Cam Newton. Everything's on him. And he just isn't living up to the expectations. So, yes, I would trade right now in a bubble Cam Newton for Sammy Watkins or Mike Evans just based off of their pure value of what I see them being next year and down the stretch. I think that it's a lot easier to replace a quarterback, and I know it sounds crazy, but I think it's a lot easier to replace a quarterback in fantasy football than it is to get an elite wide receiver and a guy who could potentially be a top five player at their position. So yes, I'm looking to make that trade. Now I do rank them, Mike Evans, slightly above Sammy Watkins, which I know sounds crazy, but Sammy Watkins crazy as it sounds, has a worse quarterback situation right now than Tampa Bay does. Um, They're also probably going to win more games than Tampa Bay, which puts them in a worse draft situation for drafting a quarterback, which I think both of these teams are a good candidate to do in 2016. So you look at these type of situations and who is going to have the possibility of getting a future elite quarterback. I think that it's more likely to be Tampa Bay. And given that, I'm going to take Mike Evans slightly above him. But what I would tell you to do in this type of a situation is that I would let both people, Sammy Watkins owner, Mike Evans owner, unless they're the same person, of course. But uh, if if two people in my league, each of them have one of these guys, I'm going to tell both of them. I'm going to say, look, I've got an offer to take Mike Evans for him. And I'm I'm going to tell the guy who has Mike Evans, I've got an offer to take Sammy Watkins for Cam Newton. What else can you guys give me? And if somebody's willing to throw something else in, or you know, maybe you have to throw in another player at another position if you've got a decent player at another position and you can get an upgrade for next year, go ahead and do it. Go ahead and make those types of trades right now if you're not going to be in the playoff contention. Just because your season is over this year doesn't mean that you can't start stacking your roster for 2016. And I know it's, it's painful to give up on the year, but sometimes you have to do it. I have to do it from time to time in leagues too. And I'm somebody who pays a hell of a lot of attention to fantasy football. Every single day I'm looking on the waiver wire. Every single day I'm reading the news and reading the practice notes and things like that. And I'm trying to figure out, I'm trying to get that edge on my opponents. But even then, bad luck happens in fantasy football. So don't get down on your luck. Don't quit on your league. Go out there and try and make the trades that are going to set you up for next season. And guys, if you're not in a keeper league, if you have never been in a keeper league, try and find one. Because I'm telling you, it's a hell of a lot more fun. It's great to be able to take a guy who you drafted in the 14th round this year and bring him to your roster next year. And a lot of leagues have it where you have to give up a 14th round pick then to keep that player. And that's not too bad because like if you got a uh, you know an elite player or somebody that broke out, a lot of times this happens with running backs. I remember one year when it was uh, Chris Johnson's rookie season, somebody in one of my leagues drafted him super late in their draft. Uh, and they ended up getting him for, I don't know, it was like a 12th round pick or something like that the next season. And Chris Johnson then just started putting up ridiculous numbers. And we had it where, you know, you are you had to give up more and more and more each year as you kept them for longer and longer. But still, he was kept on his roster, I think, until last year. I mean, it was like, it's been five, six, seven seasons now that Chris Johnson has just been balling out on this dude's team. And it's been, it's really put him in a good situation because he basically got a free running back one for like five seasons in a row. So uh, yeah, definitely try and make these trades for these elite potential up and comer type of players. And by the way, I would possibly take Kelvin Benjamin over any of these guys if you can get him. And I don't know if you're going to be able to, but think about that as well, because I know Kelvin Benjamin was going late in a lot of drafts as well. All right, 
Next question comes from Beast Hunter 2347 on YouTube, and he asks a question for a standard scoring league. He needs one wide receiver and one flex, and the group is this: Odell Beckham, Keenan Allen, Brandon LaFell, and Al. Or, uh, excuse me, I almost said Alfred Morris, Ahmad Bradshaw. Excuse me. So I'm gonna say that you can't play Keenan Allen. He's just been too slow as of late. Um, he isn't, he isn't producing the type of numbers that we're expecting him to, uh, coming into the year. I think most people expected Keenan Allen to produce similarly to what he did last year. And he is, might not even approach half of that. He's been real, real bad this season. And the other guys here, uh, you look at Odell Beckham, Brandon LaFell and Ahmad Bradshaw. I think all three of these guys are viable players for these final three or for these final spots here on your roster this week. But Ahmad Bradshaw doesn't have over 100 yards in any game this season. He's caught six receiving touchdowns, which I understand he has been a good PPR player this year. But look, receiving touchdowns typically are not that consistent for a running back. It's just, it's one of those things where it's almost always situational. They get down to the one yard line and they run, you know, some play action pass where they fake the handoff to their fullback. And then Ahmad Bradshaw's wide open in the flats and, and Andrew Luck hits him for a one yard touchdown. Great. You know, like, don't get me wrong. It's still a touchdown. You still take it. But how likely is that to continue? Not that likely. It really isn't. So I look at um, a guy like an Al- Ahmad Bradshaw, and I'm just not super excited about him. I don't uh, don't get me wrong. I'm playing him this week, but not in your situation because you have Brandon LaFell, who has been actually very very consistent this year. Especially if you were in a PPR league, I would be recommending him even more. But the thing is, is that Brandon LaFell has been putting up similar touchdown numbers to Ahmad Bradshaw over the past five six weeks here, but he's also having the potential of putting up higher yardage totals. He's had a couple hundred yard games and look this is going to be uh, this is going to be one of those games where there's going to be a lot of passing New England versus Indianapolis I see a lot of passing it's in Indianapolis so it's going to be on good field you know it's an indoor stadium there's not going to be the snow in New England or anything crazy like that so that tends to lead to more passing than it does rushing now again that's not to say Mob Bradshaw can't have a good game don't get me wrong but I like the potential that Brandon LaFell has in this game and obviously Odell Beckham, one of the hottest players in fantasy football right now. He's putting up ridiculous numbers. I'm not benching him for hardly anybody at this point. I think he's a rock solid wide receiver too right now. And until he starts not producing, he's going to be in every one of my lineups. And he pretty much whenever you ask about Odell Beckham, I'm going to say, yeah, you play Odell Beckham. He's just putting up those type of numbers. And until he proves us wrong, he's got to stay in there. Next question and the final question of the day comes from Sal Kicks Butt on Twitter and he asks, is it a good idea to bench LaShawn McCoy at Green Bay for CJ Anderson at St. Louis or Monty Ball? So it sounds like he's got CJ Anderson or Monty Ball on his roster and he's considering benching LaShawn McCoy. Now, I understand LaShawn McCoy has been extremely disappointing this year. One of the biggest busts in all of fantasy football, but I'm still going to say no. And the reason for it is the same reason that I gave earlier on a previous question, and that is that we just don't know who is going to get the touches in Denver this week. We really don't. I mean, it could be that Monty Ball goes out and gets, you know, 20 touches, and TJ Anderson gets five touches or two touches. And then what? You know, if you played CJ Anderson, you're screwed. Or vice versa. What if Monty Ball, they look at Monty Ball and they're like, okay, first of all, you're still coming off of an injury and you don't look that good in practice, which we're hearing that he looks good in practice, but not like spectacular or anything. He looks he looks healthy, basically, is what they're saying. Um, but, you know, they don't want him to be injured again. They don't want him to tweak anything. And CJ Anderson had a huge game this past week. Peyton Manning was excited about what he did. He was talking about that that's one of the best plays that he's seen in football this year. One of the best plays he's seen in quite some time. So Peyton Manning's a big fan of CJ Anderson's. I never heard him saying anything like that about Monty Ball. Now, I know obviously Peyton Manning is not the offensive coordinator there, but still something to think about that your quarterback and your all-star, your MVP, your future Hall of Fame quarterback is saying good things about one guy and not saying anything about the other guy. Again, we just don't know. And it's too hard to predict. It's too important of a time right now to get the right guy into your lineup. So I'm just going to be safe and I'm going to go ahead and say play LaShawn McCoy. So final thing that I want to do on today's episode is give you guys my starts and sits for the week. 
at our starts, if you guys are unfamiliar with this, we want to pick guys who are normally not in your lineup, but probably could be in your lineup this week. There may be low end starters at their position, and maybe you bench the guys who are your sit players. Guy, these guys are normally in your lineup, but I think maybe should not be in your lineup this week. So we'll start with the starters. I'm going to go with the, number one, Robert Griffin the third quarterback for the Washington Redskins at Tampa Bay. Last week he threw for, excuse me, two weeks ago, they had a bye week last week, 252 yards and a touchdown with an interception against Minnesota. Now that's not a great stat line or anything. He only ran for like 25 yards or something like that. But look, Minnesota is quietly a very, very good pass defense. They're fourth against opposing quarterbacks this year, and he's still put up decent numbers. Now, he's coming off a bye week. He's had an extra week to get healthy still. He's had an extra week to practice and prepare for this game, and they're going up against one of the absolute worst fantasy defenses against opposing quarterbacks. Tampa Bay is atrocious. They only have five sacks in their previous five games combined, so RG3 should be able to stay on his feet, and I think that you are going to see RG3 throw a couple of touchdown passes in this game, potentially run for some decent yards, and he's going to have a decently productive day. I think I like him somewhere between 8th to 12th at quarterback, so get him in your lineup if you've got a guy who maybe doesn't have a very good matchup this week. Next, we've got Malcolm Floyd versus Oakland. Malcolm Floyd, wide receiver for San Diego, caught five passes for 103 yards and a touchdown when these teams played last year. He already has three straight games with a touchdown against the Raiders. So he's he's been consistent against these guys. He's putting up good numbers. Malcolm Floyd is the kind of guy who can beat teams deep, and I just like his opportunity this week. I think that the San Diego Chargers are going to get back on track, and they're going to destroy the Raiders this week and hand them another loss. So definitely try and get Malcolm Floyd into your lineup if you're hurting at flex or if you have a three-wide receiver league like or something like that where you can find a spot to get him in there this week. Now for sits, again, these are guys that I'm not playing this week if I have better options. Number one, Darren Sproles at Green Bay. Now I understand Darren Sproles scored two touchdowns this past week, but one of them was on a punt return. And that to me just isn't consistent enough. I'm not going to be excited about that. And he only touched the ball twice on offense. That's not good. Two times? He caught one pass and ran the ball once. That's not good. I understand he scored a touchdown on one of the passes, but or on one of those touches, and it was the pass, I believe. But look, if you're only touching the ball two times a game and on punt returns is the only other time, okay, so yeah, you might get a, a touchdown on a punt return one out of every, like, you know, five games, possibly. If you're good, that's, what, a three-touchdown-a-year ratio? I mean, <laughs> like, that's that's great, but you can't rely on that. Even if it was Devin Hester, you still can't rely on that. And he's only touching the ball, like I said, like three to five times a game on average. So I'm just not excited about him. Don't fall for the trap of looking at what he did last week and saying it's going to happen again this week. And finally, the last guy that we're going to be sitting this week, Andre Johnson of the Houston Texans at Cleveland. Andre's not been good lately, and I understand they've got a new quarterback with Ryan Mallett, but look, he's only caught two passes for 12 yards in his previous game against Philadelphia, and I understand, like I said, Ryan Mallett could be an upgrade. He's excited about it, uh, Johnson is excited about it, but this it's this guy's first game ever, and it's look, he didn't win the job, the backup job in New England. I mean, is he really going to step in and suddenly be like an elite quarterback? I just don't see it. Maybe he targets Andre Johnson more, but like, who cares? It's not even good. It's not like he's going to go out there and get, you know, be allowed to throw the ball 40 times in a game. I don't like it at all. Arian Foster's out this game. They're going to be relying way too much on him. I think that you're going to see some interceptions in this game. And I think that there's a good possibility that Cleveland walks away with a win in this game. You know, and, and when Cleveland run wins games, they're typically running the football a lot keeping the offense off the field. I expect to see, like I said, Ryan Mallett be the guy who has to throw the ball a lot in this game because I don't think they're going to get a whole lot out of their running game. But still, I don't like Andre Johnson's chances for a big-time production in this one because I just don't think their offense is going to be on the field enough. And even if it is, they haven't had enough time to gel. I'm sorry, they just haven't. Not only that, but he's going to be lined up against Joe Hayden, who just held A.J. Green to three catches for 23 yards this past week. And I understand A.J. Green was coming off of an injury, and, and Andre Johnson isn't, but still, 
This is not a good situation, guys. Andre Johnson has not been producing even when he was healthy and when, you know, the quarterback situation was good. Now that you look at it and the quarterback situation is new and Joe Hayden's up against him, just no. Andre Johnson should be on your bench this week. And that is going to do it for today's show. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. If you did, please be sure to hit that like button below and also click the subscribe button so that you can be updated when I put out the next episode. If you guys have any questions about your lineup for this week's games, if you're looking to make a trade or just have any general fantasy football questions, please be sure to leave them in the comment section below or of course tweet them to me at ClickWithTV. Thank you guys again so much for listening in. Good luck this weekend, and we'll be back next week for a Week 11 recap here on the Fantasy Football Swagger Podcast. Good luck, guys. 